Melissa C. Gordon, and I'm the CCA's new Executive Director and your host for tonight. We are pleased to offer two free webinars tonight as part of our public education during Celiac Awareness Month. For those new to CCA, we are the national voice for people who are adversely affected by gluten and dedicated to improving diagnosis and quality of life. We provide education and support for individuals. We advocate on behalf of the celiac and gluten sensitive community and connect people to our chapters for local support and activities. A few housekeeping notes before we get started, in case you're new to webinars. Um, all attendees are muted so that everyone can enjoy the session. You, are, uh, you can ask questions by clicking the Q&A box on your screen. Uh, you can ask your question anonym, anonym, anonymously by checking the box before submitting your question. Uh, we encourage you to submit your questions when you think of it throughout the, um, throughout the webinar. We will answer as many questions as time permits uh, and that there are questions at the end. Um, any questions we don't answer, along with those we do answer, will be logged and combined with the questions from our first session tonight. Uh, we will be reviewing the questions uh, posted from the two and we'll combine them and provide a Q&A document for, for you all and we'll e email that to you once we've had a choice, uh, chance to compile them. Please note we are recording this session uh, for future posting. At the end of the session, we do have a quick survey monkey uh, that we would like you to uh, complete to help suggest for future content improvements. Your feedback is incredibly important. If you do not see the Survey Monkey link um, at the end of the, um, the webinar, uh, please let us know, or in it, we may just also uh, email it out to everyone just to make sure we get your feedback. Uh, tonight's speaker is CCA's very own expert, Sue Newell. Many of you in the celiac community um, and gluten-free community will know her very well. S Sue is our Education and Special Projects Manager for CCA. And she was diagnosed with celiac disease 21 years ago this month and has avidly followed all the new developments in the gluten-free world ever since. She spends a lot of time debunking myths about gluten-free that will show up over the internet. Sue has more than 15 years experience teaching people about leading a, gluten, a, a full gluten-free life for her Kitchener Waterloo chapter as well for the CCA National Office. She also keeps tab, uh, tabs on our 7,600 member uh, Facebook group. And thank you, Sue. Uh, we look forward to tonight. Thank you, Melissa. It's uh, really pleased to be able to do this tonight. I was just thinking when you said I was diagnosed 21 years ago this month, it was actually 29 years ago this week. I got a call on Friday afternoon just before the uh, May long weekend from my doctor who said, surprise, you have celiac disease. I'm shocked. <laughs> I wasn't shocked. And my mother who diagnosed me long before wasn't shocked at all, but it was great to finally have a solution to this. Anyway, since then I've really been pondering all of this information about gluten labeling, figuring out is that safe for me? And it's been a long challenge and there's a lot of information. The great news is things have gotten better over the last few years in terms of packaging information and that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. Let's just get this moving forward. There we go. So we're gonna really focus on four topics. What does gluten-free mean in Canada when you see that on a package? Issues with reading ingredient labels. Uh, discussion thinking about products as high and low risk. And a brief overview of what certification means and what additional comforts it brings to uh, you when you're looking at products. So let's start with what does gluten-free mean in Canada? And it's actually defined in the law, in the Food and Drug Act. It was last updated in 2012 when the requirements came for three things. There had to be no intentionally added gluten ingredients, less than 20 parts per million of gluten from unavoidable gluten contamination, usually of the source ingredients. And the food had to be made for special dietary use. And that third point is one that really separates us from other countries, including the US. So the food for special dietary use clause, it means that the food has to be made specially processed and formulated to meet the requirements of someone with celiac disease. So it's not just a food that's being made to meet the whim of the gluten-free by choice or um, 
for whatever ever other reason you can't just say here's a, a potato it's it's gluten free because it hasn't been specially processed to meet the needs of someone with celiac disease it exists like that so that's an important uh, requirement for us and that can be the thing that sets aside a gluten free claim from a product that you're just not quite sure about now gluten free also means that there's no protein from barley oats rye triticale or wheat including camut and spelt which are types of wheat um, some of you are probably looking at triticale and saying what the heck is that if you're a star trek fan triticale is what tribbles eat and if you're not a star trek fan triticale is fed to animals uh, cattle and uh, other large animals Occasionally, it's used in a, a healthy breakfast cereal, and once in a while, you'll see a chef who wants to be modern using a different grain, and they'll choose triticale. But to be honest, because it's a hybrid of rye and wheat, it doesn't really taste that great in anything except when you want a fairly strong rye flavor, and we've already got rye for that. Um, so it's not very common and we usually leave it out when we're talking about no wheat, rye, barley, or oats. Now, there's also that requirement of no hybrid, so you can't take barley and hybridize it with, uh, I don't know, chickpeas, <laughs> let's say, and say, oh, that's gluten-free because it's a hybrid of barley. And you can't, also can't take uh, uh, just part of the protein and smash it into pieces that's hydrolyzed and then use that protein in a product that's gluten-free. Because in fact, the part of the protein that causes a problem for people with celiac disease is really very tiny. And it's hard to tell that it has been completely broken down. And if it's not completely broken down, then it's not safe for someone with celiac disease. So glutens need to be labeled on every product if they're added to the ingredients. And there's two ways to do it. One is to put it in the list of ingredients, and the other is to put it in a contained statement that comes right below the ingredient list. And any added gluten needs to be named using its common name. So wheat, rye, barley, oats, or triticale. You, won't, you can't call it natural flavor, you can't call it seasonings. If there's a wheat product in there, it has to say wheat. If there's malt in there that comes from barley, it has to say barley malt or malt brackets barley. No, no hiding glutens anymore. I call them unexpected places for gluten sometimes, but it can't be hidden on the label. It has to be there in clear form. And one of the nice things about that is that Kamut and Spelt and all of those other types of ancient wheat have to be identified as wheat on the label. Uh, if you've been around for a while, you may remember the days when the health food store tried to sell you spelt bread as gluten-free. Well, it's not gluten-free. It has less gluten than wheat bread, but it's not gluten-free, and you can't call it that. So if spelt is used as an ingredient, it has to have wheat there, right there on the label, identifying it as its common name. Now, there's several different places where you want to check when you're reading an ingredient list. The first one contains is an optional uh, warning. It may or it doesn't have to be used on a, on a product, but if it's there, it has to list all of the allergens and added glutens that might be in, that are in that product. May contain, it's a precautionary statement and it's also optional. The thing that's not optional is the ingredient list. And as long as there's more than one ingredient, there has to be a list. So here's a, a sample ingredient list from some oat crackers, which we already know are not gluten-free, but I, I like this because it has all three components. Right at the top there, it's got the ingredients with the whole grain oats, the palm oil, the sea salt, and the sodium bicarbonate. And then it has that contained statement. It's in all caps with a colon after it and then the word gluten. If there were other allergens in there, it would have to list them all because it says contains. And then there's the warning in the lower case, that's a precautionary statement. It may contain traces of milk, nuts, and wheat. It may not, but it may. The uh, advice from Health Canada is if you see may contain any of, the, any of those words on there, just imagine they're in the regular ingredient list. So 
if you wouldn't eat something with wheat on the ingredient list, then you shouldn't eat something with wheat on a may contain statement either. Here's a good thing about contained statements and that requirement that they all have to be listed or none of them can be listed. This Boost product, for example, I mean, there must be at least 50 ingredients there, and most of them are pretty esoteric. Half of them are rather difficult to even pronounce. I'm seeing ferropyrophosphate. Um, ferric pyrophosphate. It has something to do with iron from the ferric part, but I have no idea what it is. But it doesn't matter because when I go down to the bottom, I see contains milk and soy ingredients, and there's no gluten mentioned there. There's no wheat, rye, barley, or oats. So I know I don't have to worry about gluten in this product. And that's a really big time saver, especially when you're looking at something like this product. Now, Campbell's, as practice, does not use contained statements. They put all of the ingredients in the ingredient list. So there's no choice but to start reading. And you might as well start at the top, water, tomato paste, sugar, wheat flour. Okay, now you know that's not safe. Now in the past it might have just said flour and you wouldn't be sure was that wheat flour or corn flour or potato flour or something else. But the requirement is since that flour contains wheat, that word wheat has to be there. It might say flour brackets wheat or it might say wheat flour, it means the same thing and it clearly means that it's not safe. So let's look at another example from Campbell's, their chicken broth. And again, you'll see chicken broth, and that inside that chicken broth, the components are water and chicken stock. But then the next ingredient, barley yeast extract, well, that just tells you right now, that yeast extract contains barley and it is not safe for someone with celiac disease. Again, you can just stop reading, you don't need to deal with the rest of it. Now, yeast extract is a little bit of a tricky ingredient because it may contain yeast. It may be derived from basically brewer's yeast, or it may be derived from baker's yeast, so there's no problem. In this particular case, it says yeast extract without the barley on it, so you know it's the safe kind of yeast extract. Uh, it, it's a little tricky. It's one of those things you just have to get used to, but Quite frankly, your eye is going to become very good at picking out the words wheat, rye, and barley. And wheat and barley are really the only two common ones. Rye shows up in rye bread and uh, a few things where you want that really strong flavor, but it's not going to show up in, in most packaged goods because it is such a distinctive flavor. So that really cuts down even more uh, to wheat and barley are your most common gluten sources that are going to show up. Now it also helps that right there on the front of the package there's that gluten-free symbol from Campbell's and that uh, also helps you interpret whether that product is safe. Now precautionary labels or warnings are those may contains and there's sort of it's sort of those warnings usually come in three forms may contain made in a plant that also processes and then some list of ingredients one of them is frequently wheat or made on equipment that also processes some list of ingredients. Now, may contain is the only one that is recommended to be used um, by Health Canada, and they have designed a recommended usage, and that is that even though we're using good manufacturing processes, we can't be sure there's not accidental gluten contamination. So you can't use this may contain to cover up for sloppy processes or sloppy ingredient sources, you have to do your best. But if you absolutely can't be 100% sure, then that's where the may contain recommendation comes in. These other two ingredient uh, warnings, made in a plant that also processes or made in equipment that also processes, quite frankly, I'm not even sure the company always knows what that means. Um, frequently it may just come from the uh, lawyers, but you know, to me it says, there's a problem here, we're not really sure, and it puts a bad taste in my mouth. I'm not inclined to um, go with products that, that use that kind of sloppy language. I want to see it definitive. It, has it got gluten in it or doesn't it? So here's a couple of examples, and this one is the one that sort of drives me nuts. 
made with love and a facility that also processes. Well, that's really nice that you love me or you love making this stuff, but you don't care enough to give me an accurate answer. <laughs> and so I'm just going to pass on this bean blend of whatever it is. Uh, you know, it might be very good, but sorry, um, it's not good enough in my mind for my own personal safety. Here's another one. This situation unfortunately shows up a lot in imported products. And you'll see that the may contain has mustard, milk, sesame, soy, wheat, oats, rye, barley, and sulfites. I call this the we don't really know what's going on, but these are all the allergens and added uh, glutens and sulfites that we carry in our, in our factory. Again, if you don't have that control, I'm not interested in giving you my business. And so to me, that would go right back on the shelf. And I look for one that has a, a clearer identity on the ingredient list. This is the sort of thing that really gets people confused because what you're going to see is that, in fact, it's a certified product. It has the gluten free certification organization, which is a different uh, certifying standard. Um, and yet it also says manufactured in a peanut-free facility on equipment that produces products containing wheat and gluten. How are you supposed to interpret that? Now, because this product has been around for a long time, and I know the company, um, I happen to know that what it means is that they use uh, a wheat-based flavoring mixture in, on one particular uh, flavor of the crackers and that they have very clear cleaning procedures and all that stuff in place but it's a very confusing thing and for a lot of people they just say you know what I'm not even gonna bother because I've got other choices and I think that's one of the things that's going to make a difference is that people do have other choices from companies that will make clear statements about what's in their products now this is brand new information just the last two weeks and it just adds a little bit of complication to the whole thing. In the past when a product said both gluten-free and may contain wheat, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency says pick one. Well, now they've decided to allow products to carry a gluten-free statement and a may contain wheat warning. And this is the logic that they say. They say the gluten-free claim is the primary one and it must be true. So no matter what, that product has to meet the gluten-free standard. And the comment is that the may contain wheat warning is to warn wheat allergic consumers of possible presence of wheat at levels lower than 20 parts per million. Now, how valid that is, is still something to be determined, but um, this has come in writing from uh, CFIA to consumers, and this is their new position. So we, as people with celiac disease or gluten sensitivity, are quite frankly going to have to get used to it. Um, I think a lot of people will just say, no, I'm not going to get used to it. Um, fine. And, and it, quite frankly, I would recommend you tell the company, I'm not buying your product because of this contradictory uh, information. Maybe you want to think about cleaning up your label. We'll see what happens. Um, I hope it will not be a common uh, adopted strategy. Let's put it that way. Oops. Now, one of the things that you have to get used to is thinking about what is the risk for this product that it might have gluten, because that's really what we're trying to calculate on every food that we look at, really every time we sit down to a meal, what is the risk of this meal that it has gluten in it? So let's think about this in terms of a potato. So potatoes, they grow underground, doesn't matter if there's a wheat field next door to the potato field, they grow underground, they're harvested completely differently, they have to be cleaned to get rid of the dirt and the stones and the rocks and anything else that comes along with pulling the potatoes. So the risk of getting gluten contamination on those is essentially zero on that plain potato as it sits. But what if you process it and you chop it into potato chips and you apply a flavoring? Well, um, flavorings, there are a few that will contain wheat or gluten as usually as a carrier to help spread the, the flavor around. 
And the one that's the most notorious for that is barbecue flavor. And unfortunately, that's caught more than a few people who say, oh, yeah, these chips are fine. And then it's like, oops, that's the one that isn't, the barbecue flavor. So now you've, you've added processing to the product, to that base potato. You've added ingredients, and you have elevated the risk. So now it needs some attention. You need to look at that product ingredient list to see, is it safe? Let's take the next step and make it into French fries. So we take that same potato, make it into French fries, but what do we do? We apply coatings to it so it'll be crispy on the outside and nice and fluffy on the inside. And then we add another risk where we, in a restaurant, we throw it into a, a deep fryer that has already fried, fried chicken, uh, breaded fish, samosas, whatever it is that they also serve along with the fries. So now we've got not only a risk from whatever's been added to the, to the French fries, but also what has been done to it or where it has come in potential contact with during preparation. Definitely a higher risk even than the potato chips. So when the new ingredient regulations came into effect, which was actually 2012, we're getting very close to the fifth anniversary, which is really quite amazing to me anyway. I, I had the opportunity to sit down and talk to the dietitians who are on our professional advisory board. And I asked them, you know, what do we recommend to people now that we have these new ingredient regulations, these new labeling regulations? We got what we were asking for. Do we tell people rely on the ingredient lists? You know, what do we do? And as we kicked it around, it sort of came to the realization that a lot of ingredients fall into two categories, high risk and a much lower risk for gluten contamination. Now, since then, we've added another ingredient, the extremely high risk ingredient of oats, but we'll get to that later. And right now, let's just talk about the high and the low risk ingredients. The high risk ingredients tend to be grains, nuts, and seeds, cereal, flour, whatever format that grain comes in, or the nuts, the ground almond flour, or seeds. And they have a variety of opportunities for contamination, right from the field, where there may be some wheat that was grown in the field last year, and now there's hemp grown in the field, but you still got some what they call volunteer plants from the wheat from the previous year that's growing up in the middle of this hemp field. How do you make sure that those are separated out? Um, in addition to having it in the base seed or in the seed that volunteers to grow up, you actually have some transfer sometimes from what's sometimes known as the bear and bird uh, channel of contamination, where they walk through one field and eat as they go and they walk through the next field or fly over the next field and um, get rid of the food as bears and birds are likely to do and that could lead to contamination undigested grains moving from one field to the next and adding additional contamination and on top of that you may well be using the same equipment for harvest uh, you may be using the same trucks to take it from the harvest to the mill at the mill, there may be the same storage bins. There may be um, the same millstones to grind it into flour, for example. And that flour may be packaged into bags using the same equipment. So there's a lot more possibility for contamination in that role, in that uh, situation. And the recommendation from us is that you look for a gluten-free claim from the manufacturer on the package, not just a store sign that says, you know, this stuff is gluten-free or it's in the gluten-free section, but an actual claim from the manufacturer. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Hemp seeds are one that sometimes surprises people. Um, a lot of people end up feeling still ill and it turns out because they're eating contaminated hemp. So here's a brand that actually says it's gluten-free down there in the lower left corner. It's right there on the package. That's the claim from the manufacturer. And this one also happens to have a gluten-free certification program logo on the back, which gives you that extra um, comfort level that this product is in fact safe for you. Starches and flours are another one 
Now, you might look in potato starch and say, well, potato is a pretty low risk ingredient. How could I, why should I worry about potato starch? Well, there was a mix company a few years ago that actually went under because they were receiving contaminated potato starch from their supplier. So they were using the same equipment to grind and create the starch. I don't know whether it was the drying or the grinding, whatever it was. And the company was saying, oh, yes, it's gluten-free. Well, it turned out they weren't testing. And, in fact, it was contaminated. This small company had to do a major recall, and that put them out of business. So not only could it potentially make a lot of people ill, but it did really bad things for a business, a going concern. So the high risk really is high risk in all of those flowers and anything derived from grains, nuts, and seeds or in this case, something ground into a flour, potatoes. Now the lower risk products would be processed foods that are not primarily made from grains, nuts, and seeds. And the re recommendation there is that you rely on the information on the package. So this might be your typical grocery shopping day and you'll see, you know, there's a variety of things there. There's some things that don't even have an ingredient list the pineapple and the bananas and the grapes and even the eggs, they're not going to have an ingredient list. But anything that's in a can or in those round plastic containers or in a box or in the bag like the chips at the top, it's going to have an ingredient list. And there really is no way around it except reading that ingredient list every time because things can change over time. You might be familiar with the brand. It might be a slightly different flavor or they may have just made a substitution and the only way they need to tell you that is on the package. That's your information source. Now, the good thing is you're actually going to get pretty good at picking out those key words really quickly. Your eye will just, you'll discover your eye just sort of learns how to zero in on wheat, rye, barley, and oats. And in fact, you're not going to find rye very often or even oats that often in many prod types of products. So it'll be just wheat and barley that you're looking for. And you really can get used to it, but it takes practice and it takes consistent performance to keep yourself safe. Now, we now have this highest risk product, gluten-free oats. It became allowable in the market using that term uh, two years ago. And right now we're in a very volatile situation where we don't have a clear answer on things. So here's our recommendation. Look for a gluten-free certification program a logo on the product or choose products that are made with oats that are grown and processed using the purity protocol as opposed to clean oats. We know with clean oats that you are starting with a product that contains wheat and barley. And the question is, how good is the process of getting those wheat and barley out of the oats? We know it's difficult. They're very similar in size and, and color frequently. There are ways to do it, and there are um, testing protocols that do a pretty good job of confirming that you've done it, um, and that's the kind of product, that's the kind of uh, situation where the gluten-free certification program is prepared to offer its uh, mark on those products. Otherwise, at this point, um, I'm simply not comfortable in eating those foods, and we would certainly recommend that you choose not to eat them as well. Some people are just saying, look, this whole oats thing, it's too confusing for me. You know what? You don't need oats to be healthy. So if you're not comfortable with it, ignore it. It's okay. Even if it's a food that you see it's got a gluten-free claim and you're not comfortable with it, it's okay just to leave it. You need to manage risk in a way that meets your own personal comfort standards. Some people choose to say, I'm only going to eat certified products. That's meeting their comfort needs for risk management. Others go much further. Everybody needs to come to their own, um, recommend, their own comfort level. Uh, what I've identified here is the CCA's recommended levels based on our best understanding of food science and food manufacturing and medical science. 
Now I mentioned briefly the gluten-free certification program. You'll see the logo that there in the left. It's got the Canadian Celiac Association name on it because we own that logo. And it's got the gluten-free mark. It may be in blue, that's most common, but I've seen it in other colors as well. It's a program that the CCA developed with the assistance of the Allergen Control Group. Uh, we needed some technical partners on this and they were they have done a great job in assisting in the development of this and do the implementation of it right now. But if a company wants to become GFCP certified, what they need to do is look at all the ways that gluten could get into a product and they need to put controls in place to prevent every one of those hazards from happening and they need to have data that demonstrates that those controls are working. So everywhere from how they acquire ingredients and how they check that those ingredients are safe before they even come into the plant to how is it packaged and they make sure that that packaging stays intact all the way to the grocery shelf. They have to look at that whole thing and find ways to make sure that there's no risk of gluten contamination and have that data that demonstrates it. Now, there's a technical review of all of those documents that they provide and test results, and there's on-site inspection by an independent, trained food safety auditor. Now, that's not an internal auditor that works for the companies. They have those too, but this is someone who's got, let's say, five years of experience working for a food safety audit company. They have been specifically trained by um, GFCP personnel in exactly what is needed. And that only then are they allowed to do those inspections that leads to the final sign off and the right to use that logo on a product. Now, one thing that's really important and that differentiates the gluten free certification program from others is that it certifies facilities, not products. So, when you're certifying the facility, it means everything that goes to that facility is going to meet those standards, um, not just products where you may, you know, different standards have different levels of testing, but it may come down to occasionally testing an end unit for gluten contamination, then that's not really adequate from our point of view. So what this says when a manufacturer chooses to use GFCP or another certification is that they've chosen to take that extra step to make sure their products are safe for you, and it adds that extra level of comfort and, and confirmation from you. Doesn't mean that a product that just says gluten-free is unsafe. This is just showing that extra level of, of uh, safety. So those are the key pieces of information I wanted to give to you today. Um, Melissa, do we have some uh, questions from the uh, folks? Yes, we do. We've got about 21 questions and uh, today from our 76 participants. So great uh, Great night here. So the very first question was, um